next we have uh, Matilde Signorini, who is going to tell us about distance measurements with active galactic nuclei. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for introducing me and thanks for having me here. For those of you who do not know me, I'm Matilde Signorini. I've recently become a postdoc at the University of Roma 3 in Rome. And today we'll discuss how to use active galactic nuclei to measure cosmological distances. I'm mostly an observational astronomer, so uh, if I take anything for granted, uh, which is not, please interrupt me, feel free to do that. And I just want to briefly uh, shout out some of the people I've been working with in the past few years on this topic. There are also many more that I could not add uh, pictures of, uh, but I'd also like to simply uh, show you my outline for today. Uh, I will mainly discuss the use of the LX-LUV relation uh, for using quasars as standard candles, some of the most recent updates and some work in progress in regard of the cosmological implementation. If I have time in the end, I'd also like to expand on other ways to standardize AGN emission that we're currently working on in Rome, in particular the study of the variability luminosity relation. So uh, starting off, I don't think I have to convince you that we care for standard candles uh, because we can use it to uh, test cosmological models in the Hubble diagram. And we all love supernovae, but we do not really observe them at redshift higher than 1.5. And even at redshift higher than 1, there's not many of them. And so in determining the shape of this Hubble diagram, this leaves the first billion years of the expansion history uninvestigated. This is when quasars can help. So um, quasars are very powerful object. We observe them almost at all redshifts now. And they're also very numerous, which is another important property for a standard candle. Sad news is that they're not standard. So their luminosity can vary up to many orders of magnitude between an object and another. So simply by observing a quasar, we have no idea where it is. Luckily, we have a way to standardize its emission. This is uh, thanks to an observational result, which is the existence of a nonlinear relation between the X-ray and the UV luminosity of quasars. It's usually parameterized as a linear relation in the logarithmic space uh, with a slope of around 0.6. And um, this relation, I said it's an observational result because we are still not clear about the physics that's behind it. We know it has something to do with it the interaction between the UV accreting emitting disk around the supermassive black hole and what we call the X-ray corona, which is, we think it's above it or around it, but the exact mechanism is still something that is debated. Nevertheless, this relation exists and it's easy to see that if we substitute the luminosity fluxuration, we can derive a luminosity distance estimate for a quasar only by knowing its X-ray and UV flux and the values of the parameters of the relation. Now, this relation had been known for decades, but it had not been implemented in cosmology due to the very high observed dispersion. If you look at the gray points over here, you see that there is a significant scatter around 0.4 dex. So this is a log-log scale. This scatter is incredibly big. And so this is too much to do anything meaningful for cosmology. However, it was found recently that uh, most of this dispersion is not due to the relation itself, but actually to the presence of biased objects in the sample. So if we remove objects that might be affected by dust reddening, gas absorption, or by the Eddington bias, we go from the gray to the yellow sample here, so from 0.4 to 0.24. And for objects for which we have very high quality data, which are the blue stars over here, we even go down to 0.12. So this is enough to build a Hubble diagram, uh, and you see how much we can extend this in terms of redshift. Cyan points are supernovae 1A, and red points are the average for quasars in small redshift bins. So obviously the scatter is still much higher than what we could do with supernovae, but still, even with this high scatter, we find a four sigma tension with the predictions of a flat lambda CDM model. So given this conference is about tension, uh, the lambda CDM prediction is the magenta dashed line here, while the best fit for quasars and supernovae together is the black solid line. So in this context, there are still many important questions that we need to address. And so I'd like to show you some of our results in trying to answer this question and also some work in progress. Uh, the first important question is, okay, can we trust this relation to do cosmology? And the most important quality that this relation must have is that it has to be independent from redshift. So it doesn't have to evolve with time, otherwise it's useless. 
The way we test this is that we divide our quasar sample in small Redshift bins and then test the relation using fluxes instead of luminosity, so we are cosmology independent. And what we find, you can see in the upper panel here, that the slope of the relation gamma, which is the important parameter here, doesn't evolve with the Redshift. And this has been tested over and over for different samples with different properties that I won't bother you uh, with, but uh, if you have questions after, I'll happy to answer. Uh, and in the lower panel, you see the dispersion parameter, so how big is the scatter around the uh, relation. And you see this is also doesn't show significant evolution with the redshift. Now let me introduce here the, so these are old results, let me introduce the new sample that we're working on, it's still a work in progress, but basically what we've been using until now are data from the Lusso 2020 sample, we're currently updating it using the most recent SDSS and XMM Newton uh, catalogs, but also we have improved the way we select in the X-ray our objects. Uh, to make it short, we care about the slope of the X-ray spectrum for quasars in order to be sure for them not to be obscured. Uh, however, spectroscopy is very time consuming in the X-ray, so we use photometry. And basically, we found a way to better use our photometric data so that we are more sure now that our objects don't have any signs of obscuration in the X-ray. And when we we are still working on this sample. The statistic is a little higher than the previous one, so around 3,000 objects. Uh, and you see here the results of feeding the relation in small redshift bins, or probably it's more clear in this way. Again, even for this new updated sample, we don't see any evolution of the slope with the redshift. And also we see a significantly lower dispersion. So we go from 0.24 to 0.17, so we can get more precise uh, cosmological distance measurements, basically. And, um, oh yeah, just to show you that the tension with the predictions of the Lambda CDM model is also there with this updated sample. So another question about this relation that we tried to answer recently has to do with the intrinsic dispersion of the relation itself. So I said we do not really know the physics of interaction between the disk and the corona. We would like to do so. And we would like to know how much of the dispersion that we still see is actually due to other observational causes. In particular, the inclination with respect to the line of sight and the variability of quasar's emission, which is something that we know exists. And so in this work that has been on the archive for a while, but last week was also finally published, so uh, check it out. Um, we found that if we account for these quantities, basically we can say that the intrinsic dispersion of the relation must be below uh, 0.06 dex. Now, I've thrown a lot of numbers at you, so let me recap it here in this plot. Um, so this red line, so here I'm showing you the uncertainties that we have on the measurements of luminosity distances. The uh, red line here is the Lusso 2020 sample, so what we've been using uh, until now. The dashed line here is this new sample we are currently working on and that we hope to publish in this year. Uh, but also we have that for the best quality data that we have, we reach dispersion that are much lower, just for as in the Saki 2022 paper. And we find that the intrinsic dispersion of the relation uh, must also be something of the order of that. And so comparing it with the uncertainties that we have of supernovae, we are still not there. Maybe we won't be ever be uh, so small in terms of uncertainties, but still there, is, there has been significant progress over the years and we hope to have um, more in the future. Uh, moving on to the second question I showed you at the beginning, I just wanted to mention this other work that has been recently uh, published by Bartolomeo Trefoloni, uh, where among other things we addressed a question which was, can the tension that we see with the Lambda CDM prediction be due to uh, residual reddening that we are not able to remove from our sample. So we think our selection is clear, we are removing biased objects, but maybe we are not so good at it, and this can cause a tilt in the oh, Hubble diagram that we observe. Now, if you look at this Hubble diagram here, basically the uh, stars are the quasars, and the black stars is where they should be for lambda CDM. And so we measured how much reddening would be needed in order for us to observe the Hubble diagram that we observe. And uh, the amount of reddening that is needed is huge. So if we want to explain this tension with reddening, this means that the UV spectra that we observe would have to have clear evidence of that. While you see here on the left that instead, these are a stack of stacks of um, 
quasar spectra in the UV, and basically we see no evidence whatsoever of reddening, or at least not enough to explain the quantity that would be needed for detention. So, if you trust the presence of attention with the lambda CDM model, we can also ask, okay, so if the tension is there, what is the kind of cosmological model that quasars are hinting at, at least? And let me go back to this 2022 paper and then show you some more uh, recent results. So in this paper by um, Jada Barjaki, we put together supernovae quasars and also BAO. And what we find in a cosmological fit is that, okay, if we assume lambda CDM, we get an omega matter around 0.3 as expected. Also because supernovae are much more um, tight in terms of the uh, dispersion on the Hubble diagram. If we go to a WCDM kind of model, we find that the best value for W is something around minus 1.5. As you can see, this contour plot is at a three sigma from the green dot, which represents the prediction of lambda CDM. And if we go to varying uh, dark energy models, uh, we, also, we again find a hint of that, so of a phantom dark energy component, and also an omega matter that as a consequence to counterbalance it, let's say, uh, goes to higher values. So this doesn't necessarily mean that we are measuring a higher value of omega matter. Obviously we know that 0.7 is not something that is possible. It's just a hint that lam flat lambda CDM is not enough to, or at least it's not the best fit for our data. And what I wanted to show is that um, these are very preliminary results, but very recently we had the, uh, as someone has already mentioned that many other probably will do in this week, uh, we have the new supernovae uh, data set from the Dark Energy five-year survey. And there is a hint that this new supernovae might be going in the same way as quasars. What do I mean by that? If we go back to this Hubble diagram, you see that the tension starts to build up, so these two lines diverge, uh, just when we don't have any more supernovae. And in general, the bulk of supernovae from the Pantheon sample is at much low, smaller redshifts. Uh, you can see more clearly here in this histogram, the black line is Phantom Plus, this new uh, DS uh, supernovae sample is yellow and quasars are in blue. And so given that these supernovae have a higher redshift, we try to do this exercise, let's say, which is the following. Uh, we try and fit lambda CDM model, letting omega matter being whatever it wants to be, uh, by varying the minimum redshift. So basically we divide our sample and we remove the lower and lower redshifts. Uh, and what we see is that, um, for example, you see here, uh, for Pantone, we cannot go further than 0 0.3 because most of this information is there. Uh, but using these new supernovae, we actually see an increase of the omega matter with the average redshift that we obtain. Obviously, the significance is not, I mean, it's two sigma, so it's nothing uh, crazy. But if we look at quasars instead that have an average redshift of one point something, uh, we can at least say now that, okay, quasars alone say that omega matter is a huge value. This obviously doesn't make any sense. But uh, in the context of saying, is flat, flat lambda CDM enough to explain the data that we see, we might starting to see that also supernovae are saying that something is off and we hope that in the future as we have higher and higher ratio supernovae that will um, increasingly be true. Um, so I'll switch completely subject for the second part of my talk. Uh, with just a few minutes because these are also something I've been working on for a few months. But I wanted to present to you the fact that here in, uh, here in Rome, we're currently working on another way to standardize AGN emission that is based on the um, dependence between the AGN luminosity and variability. So it is well known that more luminous AGN tend to be less variable than uh, less luminous ones, uh, as can be seen, for example, in this uh, Paulillo paper. Uh, and so the thing is, if we monitor an AGN for long enough time uh, and we can get an estimate, an accurate estimate of its variability, maybe we can use this to estimate its luminosity and therefore its distance. Uh, so this has already, had already been done, for example, in this paper from 10 years ago. Obviously, you see the scatter around this, the significance of the relation is there, but the scatter is huge. So uh, even worse than where we started at with uh, the Alexa-LUV relation. 
so currently we are working on using X-ray variability because it's the one which has the highest amplitude uh, and it's the quickest. So it's easier to have uh, high uh, cadence data that gives us how much an AGN is varying. Uh, and we are using this bus sample, which is the most complete sample of um, local AGN for which you have spectroscopic information. And in this case, we have around 150 objects and you see here um, the, uh, the variability is measured in, as an excess variance, but this is just a, measure, a way to measure variability. And so what we are finding as a preliminary result is that, okay, with this increased statistic sample, we indeed see a, a bit smaller of a dispersion compared to what was previously found in the literature, but these values are still incredibly too high to do cosmology. However, we have reason to believe, given AGN physics that now can help us uh, address these issues, uh, that we expect these quantities also to depend on the uh, full lethal max of the uh, emission line of these objects and also on the red Dinton ratio. So we are currently working in trying to implement spectroscopic information to see if we can reduce the dispersion. So stay tuned for that. I guess. And we're also currently working in trying to see if we can use optical variability to do the same. Now, optical variability has much smaller amplitude, so it's even harder to have a decent detection of variability. But in the coming future, we're going to have tens of thousands of objects with the coming surveys for which we have monitor, we're going to have a monitor over a decade, basically, even at short times. And so we are trying to see whether uh, we can uh, let's say, be prepared for when this data is coming in the next decade. And maybe if we have tens of thousands of objects, we will also be able to use optical variability to measure luminosities and so maybe distances. Uh, I think I was even ahead of my time, so I'll leave here my conclusion and happy to have any questions. Okay, thank you, Mathilde. Is there any questions, comments? From the audience. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> I was wondering about this you know, relationship between X ray luminosity and UV and the difference you're getting, and whether uh, gamma could be somehow varying your, mm -hmm. your, your mean gamma there, and, and how much of that have to be to explain your differences with lambda CDM, and how do you control that? So, if we take this one for example, the uh, okay, there is not fully constant, or there is a little bit of scatter, but the amount of which it would have to be to explain the, uh, the tension is actually much, much bigger, uh, like two orders of magnitude in terms of difference. And the important thing, and so um, this cannot explain the tension, and also um, we also try to fit the Hubble diagram using gamma as a free parameter. So there's a debate over here, like, okay, do we fit using fluxes instead of luminosity? So we control for cosmology, and then we trust this value. So we say, okay, the truth is that gamma is 0 0.56. And so we use it as a fixed number in fitting the Hubble diagram. Uh, but even if we leave it as a free parameter uh, in the Hubble diagram, and we let it find the true gamma, we find a value which is the same as we find with this method, and the tension uh, is still there. So, if there was something that was evolving over time in, which, in such a high manner, we would observe it by controlling with fluxes. Thanks. Uh, very nice talk. Um, so it was very nice to see that uh, your, your scatter reduced when you removed the uh, object with extinction. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm wondering, uh, depending on how you remove these the object was extinction. Does, how does that affect the gamma? Because there's uh, some variation with uh, gas to dust ratio, right? So it, it affects mm -hmm. differently UV luminosity and X-ray luminosity. So depending how you remove it, I was worried, I'm worried that the gamma is going to change. So. Yeah, okay, well, thank you, good questions. Um, so we remove it by using a color color that I don't have a backup plot about that, but I can show it to you later. Uh, so basically we do a color color diagram uh, and we did simulations in order to say that we only consider objects inside a region of the color color diagram so that we would not see uh, the gamma of the relation to be affected. 
if that makes sense. Uh, but also we controlled, this was done when we were using only photometry. Now we also controlled spectroscopically um, the objects that we're using and there is no sign of reddening, uh, I mean, or not enough to explain the tension. And for the dust gas uh, situation, we also select on the X-ray using the X-ray slope, basically. Uh, so we only take quantities that we are sure are not obscured. And so we know we cannot trust one way to uh, test the other, uh, you know, you cannot trust that something that is not reddened is not dusty, but by summing the two way to select uh, that are independent from one another, uh, we are pretty sure that we are controlling for that. Okay, thank you. Uh, very nice talk. Thank you. I have a question about uh, when you are doing cosmology with it and you have observational data set, quasi supernova and BAO. Mm -hmm. So you see that you are very far away from the ambassadium. So is it happening because you are taking all the quasars, or if you take quasars before redshift 1.5, you have well, like demon with lambdacidium, and only after the redshift 1.5, you have mm -hmm. this activity. Okay, so at low, given the distribution of redshift that we have for quasars, at redshift below one, supernovae are like uh, the vast majority of the data. So whatever, if you fit with quasars below like 1.2 or something and supernovae, you get the same results as only using supernovae, basically. And what happens if you just use quasars before redshift 1.5? Then you get, um, which paper was, I uh, remember, which data paper was that? Uh, the plot. Sorry. Yes, I, I remember a paper by Rizal et al, which appeared uh -huh. in Nature, and shared before 1.5, it is in agreement with lambda senior. Oh yeah, because uh, but it's, it's, yeah, it's just that the cosmological power below 1.5 is basically nothing. So it's, it's a, I think it's, it's not completely clear to say that below 1.5 there is agreement. I mean, yes, the tension starts to build up after 1.5, but because below 1.5, you don't have power to resolve uh, any difference. I don't know if this answered your question. Yeah, okay. and then I have another question. So when you were showing this omega M0 plot with redshift, uh -huh. so the error bar for quasars is really small. So uh, as compared to Pantheon, is it because the number of sample size is bigger? Uh, you mean compared to the red dots? Yes, yes, it's because the number of objects, like quasars now are in that point, if you take all of them, are more than 2,000. Uh, while when you go at higher and higher redshift, okay, the DES has a higher redshift, but not that high. So if you look here above, um, above 0 0.5, they rapidly decline. So the uncertainties you have on the red points are, are this big because of that. So if in the future we might have 10 times more supernovae in that redshift range, you might uh, be able to constrain it better. And, and why just you put one point of four quasars there and not two? Uh, because, because this was done last week very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, thanks. And thank you, very nice talk. Um, so if you, if you go back to the plot where you were showing the dispersion parameter. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, there is a very slight trend there, right? It's very small, but you can see that it kind of dips down. And then there was another plot you showed uh, before this and had um, an outlier, yeah, that one, the one, this one, yeah, at um, higher redshift. So now I'm wondering if this could point to some sort of systematic at higher redshift. Maybe there is some sort of selection bias because these are higher redshift quasars. So okay, so the the reason we believe that the dispersion is lower at high redshift when we are able to get the data is that. Uh, when you go at high redshift, you're almost certainly observing uh, face-on objects uh, because if they're inclined, you're not going to observe them. And so the impact of inclination, which is something of 0.06 dex, for high redshift subsample is probably nothing. And the same goes with variability. So more luminous quasars are less variable. And so going at higher redshift, both for selection effect, but also for the population of quasar, they tend to be more luminous. And so also the variability component is reduced. So this is why we think there is the trend of the dispersion with the redshift. Uh, and we also have a couple of subsamples of objects at redshift three uh, with pointed X-ray observations, which were the, um, the stars in this plot over here. Uh, and when we have this kind of, for these objects, we have 0 0.12, so even lower than their neighboring 
objects at the same redshift, and this is because they have pointed observations in the X-ray. So we also believe that there is some scatter that comes from the fact that we're using serendipitous observations in the X-ray, which might not be the, the best way ever to measure their fluxes. So, but in principle, if we could get 2,000 pointed observations, uh, we might even reduce it further, even for lower redshifts. Okay. And there, is there a way to remove the John poisons? Sadly, no, because, I mean, at low redshift, you can use the oxygen-3 line as an inclination proxy if you want, but below, above redshift 0 0.7, uh, that, I mean, at least from, because these are all SDSS spectra, so uh, at higher redshift, you don't have that line, and currently there's no other way way to measure the inclination so that you can correct for it. Thank you. Uh, I, I see your uh, Asian data gives the dark energy equation of state is smaller than minus one and is inconsistent with the recent deficit result from semi plus yeah. and supernova. So what do you think? I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> I mean, they're pointing in different direction. My my idea, but also I'm not a cos I'm more an observational astronomer. But it seemed to me that if two different things are pointing at two different ways, maybe it's the I mean WCDM model would also mean that that is also not the correct model. There might be something else that once projected for uh, BAO and other probes gives us different results, but the truth is something else uh, that we're trying to measure with a WCDM model. Uh, that's the only answer I can give me for... For, for me, uh, cosmology now is a mess. So I will try to, um, try to believe HM samples. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let's take Matilde one more time.